Another week on Xylogamoto, another game to take a look at. But first, let me set the stage a bit. When I say great NASCAR driver, who do you think of? Do you think about the King, Richard Petty? Or maybe the Intimidator, Dale Earnhardt? Or maybe you're younger, so you think of Jimmy Johnson or Jeff Gordon? Well, all those are good choices, and if you were doing a list of the top 10 NASCAR drivers of all time, they would all be in there somewhere. It's hard to argue with 25 total top series championships. But, of those drivers, did any of them have any level of success outside of stock cars? Petty and Earnhardt were both lifetime stock car drivers, which makes sense due to their age, and Jimmy Johnson briefly raced off-road before transitioning to NASCAR full-time. Gordon had the most varied career of those four, and was very successful running sprint cars before graduating to stock cars. If you're going to look at the most successful NASCAR driver that was a legit threat in other racing styles, that would probably be Tony Stewart, who twice completed the double duty of racing in both the Indianapolis 500 and the Coca-Cola 600 in the same day, and actually performing well in both despite open-wheel cars and stock cars being very different things. And also, Stewart was well known for his sprint car prowess as well, oftentimes running in sprint races in the middle of the week between NASCAR events, until a fatal accident with another driver effectively ended his career. But long before Stewart, Mario Andretti, of this week's game, Mario Andretti Racing, had a similar affinity for all types of vehicles that go fast. In Mario's earliest days, he had success in sprint cars for a few years before starting to split time between primarily champ cars, aka Indy cars, and NASCAR. While Mario was only a part-time driver in NASCAR, he did spend enough time there to become one of only two drivers to win the Daytona 500 and the Indianapolis 500, along with A.J. Foyt. And along with Mario's success in Indy cars, he also managed to have success racing in Formula One, winning the Formula One championship in 1978. By the time that Mario Andretti Racing was being released for the Genesis in late 1994, Mario had come to the end of his full-time racing career, finishing 14th in his final year in Indy cars, before going off to compete in the 24-hour Le Mans, and passing the torch to his sons Michael and Jeff, and his nephew John. Electronic Arts, who had previously released Mario Andretti's Racing Challenge for the PC in 1991, decided it would be a good idea to release another title under the Andretti name, capitalizing on Mario's impending retirement. While Mario Andretti's Racing Challenge is a very different game than Mario Andretti Racing, with Racing Challenge being an early polygonal base title, one aspect transfer between the two titles, and that was the idea of trying to feature multiple types of racing in each game, to reflect upon Mario's varied career. Mario Andretti Racing chooses to just focus on three of those disciplines, sprint cars, stock cars, and open wheel vehicles. However, despite releasing a few titles here and there, EA was not known as a racing game publisher at the time, and while it's difficult to release a game that one does well, it's that much more difficult to do three things well. So did EA pull it off and we ended up with an excellent late Genesis racing game release? Or in their attempt to juggle multiple things, did EA and Stormfront Studios drop the ball in yet another example of the Andretti curse? Well, let's check it out. But first, we'll look at the physical package. And here we have Mario Andretti Racing. And with this being a 1994 and up release, EA had officially switched to their EA Sports branding for the sports titles, and along with that, the white covers to their games, to make them stand out on a shelf. The pure white backgrounds and spines are a bit boring to be sure, but you know immediately when you look over at them that they are EA Sports titles. Just a quick note as well, you can see that this is a standard EA normal sized clamshell but this game was also re-released in a much more rare cardboard box variant, I assume by Majesco, with EA title Road Rush 2 also getting a similar variant. So if you have either of these games in the cardboard box versions, even though they're not really worth much now, you may want to hold on to them, or even get them graded, as with the way the market's changing, the rarity of those releases may eventually drive the prices up. But this isn't that, it's just the normal clamshell, which is in good shape minus a small ding on the front. EA didn't put hang tabs on their clamshells for whatever reason, so don't have to worry about whether the bit is removed or not and the damage it causes. Flipping over to the spine real quick, I really like this logo. It looks sharp and makes it stand out. 
I probably would have printed Mario's name in the same font rather than going with the signature, but I understand why they did it. On over to the back, and now we're talking. Not a ton of flavor text, just a quote from Mario at the top and stats down below about all the options available in game, and six good quality screenshots that all make the game look better than it really is. Whoever did this layout did a really good job, I'm impressed. Down at the bottom, they of course let you know that it's a 16 megabit release to sell the title, and I wasn't joking about the game being released to take advantage of Mario's swan song in IndyCar Racing, as down in the lower corner you can see this graphic for Arrivederci Mario 1994 signifying saying goodbye to the namesake. Opening up the case, and we've got a full box here. The cartridge is in good shape and has the signature EA yellow tab. And FYI, part of what makes those cardboard box releases I mentioned earlier special is the cartridge in those comes in a standard Genesis cartridge shell, not the yellow tab, in case you see them out in the wild. Moving on, along with a nice thick manual, we've also got a warranty reply card, a card advertising EA's hint line, which I don't really understand why they were advertising it with a sports title, but whatever, and a fold-out poster which has tips for playing the game on one side and advertising for current and upcoming titles on the other. Very cool stuff. Quickly, about the manual, this was definitely during the manual glory days. EA usually included solid manuals for their sports titles, and this one is no different, coming in at 56 pages and some more game ads at the back. Inside, there's almost too much information for what is actually a relatively simple game, but I like how it breaks down the various circuits, tracks, and drivers towards the end, and even closes things out with a glossary. All the info you really need to know is in the game, but it just makes the package more complete having it all printed out here. Well, that's enough about the surprisingly complete package. Let's move on to some racing. Where to start? Well, Mario Andretti Racing at its core is a game that tries to capture the feeling of being a young driver and try and work your way up through the ranks to become champion of multiple racing divisions, similar to Mario himself. However, other than the fact that Mario participated in each of the disciplines included in the game, sprint cars, stock cars, and indie cars, the game has nothing to do with its namesake. Yes, there technically is a practice mode where you drive around the tracks by yourself and supposedly get tips from Mario, but let's be honest, if it was, say, Bobby Rahal giving me tips instead of Mario, it wouldn't make a single bit of difference to the experience, as they're just words on a screen. I just feel like there could have been a lot more done with the game rather than having it come off as a cheap cash-in with his impending retirement. Mario Andretti is used as a marketing tactic for the game and nothing more. Obviously he appears on the cover of the box and in the title screen of the game, but other than that he makes no appearances in the game, aside from the previously mentioned practice mode tips. You don't get him as a competitor and you don't drive for Andretti Racing. They could have literally removed his name from the game, call it something like EA Sports Racing, and no one would know the difference. They could have done so much more, like even have a thin storyline that you were a hotshot upcoming driver that was given the opportunity to drive for Andretti with the goal being eventually taking his place due to the stepping down, but no. And I don't really get it either. They went through the trouble of naming each of the nine competitors in each of the three divisions, and even providing a little story for some of them in the manual, it's like they got right to the good idea ledge, but didn't step over. Moving on to the game itself, the game features a total of 15 individual unlicensed tracks for you to race on. I say unlicensed because while I can't say for certain that all the tracks are based on real life places, there's at least a few, like Daytona, that are in the game as their track shape is unmistakable. However, each track is limited to a discipline, meaning that the first five tracks can only be used with sprint cars, the next five for stock cars, and etc. While this makes some sense, as you wouldn't want to drive a sprint car around Daytona or a massive road course, it unfortunately is limiting for a stock car any car perspective, as those vehicles would be perfectly capable of running on each other's tracks. Even with the restriction of which cars can race on which tracks, the game at least has a decent amount of modes to choose from. There's the aforementioned practice mode, a single race mode against nine computer opponents, 
a two-player mode where you can pick a track and go at it against eight computer drivers, circuit modes where you can attempt to win the championship of either the sprint, stock, or indie car racing by driving through each of the five tracks for that style, or finally, a career mode that has you start out in the sprint circuit and then work your way up to the stock car circuit before finally trying to win the IndyCar championship. I really like the idea of having multiple styles of racing in-game. As with other games that focus on only one type of car, things can get a bit boring. Mario Dreddy Racing specifically stands out because there's more going on here than just going fast in cars that look different. Each of the types of cars drive decidedly differently, and learning to be successful and competitive in a sprint car is completely different than a stock car or an indie car. At the time, many racing games were content to follow the outrun methodology of slow down for turns, gas everywhere else, and that's fine, but learning how to properly counter steer on the dirt sprint tracks or draft in the stock car courses to pass is really fun and adds some much needed depth to the game, which separates it from the crowd. To that end, I'd say control in the game is a bit of a mixed bag. As cool as having three different types of cars that all respond differently to the controls is, it only works if the computer cooperates. What do I mean by that? Well, you're more than likely not going to have any problems guiding your car around the track, even if you choose to go with manual shifting instead of automatic. However, the problem comes when you start to compete with other drivers for track position. Attempting to pass in the game is a pain. To put it mildly. Now, I don't necessarily have a problem with the other drivers being competitive and working to stop you from passing them. That's realistic, and if it was too easy to pass, the whole game would probably turn into a cakewalk. However, I think EA went a little too far the other way. Frequently, when trying to pass a car ahead of you, you'll attempt to go around them, more often than not either on the right or left because the computer is taking up the middle lane. Again, to be expected in this sound race strategy. But, most of the time, unless you maneuver way to the outside or inside, you're going to run into the car ahead of you, slowing down and, worst case scenario, allowing the car behind you to also catch up and potentially pass. This is because of poor collision detection. You'll think you have plenty of room to make the pass, because on the screen you do have plenty of room, but then an invisible barrier will force you back until you get in position to go wider if the position on the track even allows it, and try again. You'll eventually learn to deal with it, but there's nothing more frustrating than getting stuck in the middle of the pack as the leaders escape away because you can't pass anyone, even though you know you've got a faster car. After you've learned the basics to figure out how to get around the track with minimal bumping, you will probably spend most of your time in either circuit or career mode, with circuit mode simply being a pared down version of career mode that is shorter to finish as you don't progress through the ranks. You just simply attempt to be the champion of one type of car. The goal in either version is simple. Finish in a high enough position in each of the five races of the circuit that you're on so that you finish the circuit in top position. For every completed race, you earn money and points depending on where you finished, and in a nice touch, each circuit is different. Points assigned in sprint comp are different than in stock cars, which are different than any cars, which is a nice nod to how real-life series have different scoring systems. You earn more money depending on which series you're in as well, which these days actually would have NASCAR flipped with IndyCars due to how drastically those sports have changed in the last 25 years, but for the purposes of the game, it's fine. You will need all that money as well, as there is exactly zero chance of winning any championship without upgrading your car. Cars can be upgraded in five levels for their brakes, tires, and engines, and you can also upgrade your pit crew when competing in stock car or Indy racing circuits to get you in and out of the pits faster. Also, tires are special in that they have to be upgraded for each race, which sometimes leads to a bit of strategy depending on which other upgrades you're trying to budget for. There were a few times where I tried to get by with, say, only level 3 tires instead of level 5 tires, because that gave me enough money to purchase the next level engine upgrade. However, sometimes even with practice and car upgrades, you may not finish first place in the circuit, which means you get to start the circuit over from the beginning, but keep any money or car upgrades that you've purchased. I like this approach a lot, and it gave me the feeling of trying to build something from the ground up. Also, your opponents are quite competitive, 
So with only five races per circuit, your finish in each and every one is important. So you can't slack off if you want that first place position and to migrate to the next discipline if you're in career mode. Also, while car upgrades don't transfer, which makes sense as they're different types of cars, your saved cash does, and gives you a nice little boost when starting the next circuit type. Well, if you manage to save any before transferring, that is. While I would have liked to have seen more of, well, everything, more opponents, more tracks, longer circuits, and more options, it's hard for me to argue with the base setup of circuit and career mode in Mario Andretti Racing. However, what I can argue about are the overall aesthetics of the game, both visual and oral. To be perfectly blunt, the game is pretty ugly, especially for a 16-bit title in late 1994. This wasn't the dawn of the 16-bit era by any means, but you couldn't tell that by looking at it. Cars are ugly blobs on black rectangles that only show any kind of detail during turns when you're in danger of spinning out. None of the racetracks have stands for the audience, but it's just a generic fence on the outside of the ovals. The tracks themselves are either boring brown or gray, and while the background horizon matches the description of the track from the manual, the art is low in detail. Compounding the graphics issues, the game engine defaults to a two-screen setup, which means you're only seeing the bottom portion of the screen, and even when you do switch it to full screen mode, it becomes obvious that the designers didn't plan for that, as you'll mainly see just a bunch of empty sky. Another problem with the graphics in the game is that none of the tracks have any kind of embankment. They're all flat as a board, which is a huge problem for both sprint and stock car ovals. I get that this would have been more work on their part, but a Daytona style track without an embankment? It makes no sense. There are some elevation changes on the road courses, so they at least recognize the need for some variety, and I do like how those elevation changes introduce blind spots somewhat realistically. The back of the box advertises 16 megabits in size, and I just have to wonder, where did it go? As far as the in-game sound is concerned, when you're not in a race, it actually has some pretty decent music with that old school EA synth sound. However, as soon as you start a race, it's all muddy engine noise and the occasional bash sound for when you hit another vehicle. It gets a little better when you make it to stock car or IndyCar mode, as you have a pit crew that speaks to you and lets you know how you're doing or if you need fuel, and I guess that maybe that digitized speech contributes to the 16 megs, but we're not talking sports talk baseball here either. All in all, I'm giving Mario Andretti Racing two stars. When I first started playing it, I was ready to give it just a 1, as there's a bit of a learning curve to sprint car mode, the collision detection issues are a pain, and the game features a password system and not battery backup. But the more I played it, the more I was able to have fun with it, and it does get better when you're out of sprint cars and into the stock and indie cars. It's still an ugly game, and to me, it's a waste of the Andretti name license, but it does have some charm, like anticipating hitting the gas with a drop of the green flag, and the satisfaction of earning upgrades for your car. It's not the worst racing game I've played on Genesis, but you can probably do a lot better unless the career mode appeals to you. Okay, and that was Mario Andretti Racing, a game that I feel like was close to being good. It had some decent ideas, it did some things well, but ultimately it just had too many flaws to overcome and it probably needed a sequel or two to really get on its feet. And honestly, that's pretty emblematic of the Andretti curse. Close, but no cigar. At least I had some fun playing Mario Andretti Racing, and that's not always a guarantee when playing these titles. Tune in next week when I head back to the Master System for just the fifth time this year so far. This time, I'll be playing what's described as a side-scrolling beat-em-up, but honestly, I'm not so sure about that, as I've never played it. It's a port of an arcade title that was only released in Japan, but the Master System version was only released in Europe, similar to what we saw with Basketball Nightmare way back in Episode 8. Regardless, I'll be interested to experience it for the first time, and hopefully that experience will be a good one. I need a game that's better than a 2 after these last two weeks. Remember, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!